What a privilege to be with you guys. I've got 1,800 seconds to try to get along a message here, so we'll just jump in. Um, there are only two views among us. The one is that there's the, uh, everything is the result of a cosmic accident, or we're the result of a deliberate design, and that implies a designer. That's the first why in the road that, div that would divide us. Now, that basic thing brings us each to three questions, personal questions. Where did I come from? Why am I here? And where am I going when I die? Those issues face every one of us. Now, most of you that know me from our broadcast or whatever know that our entire ministry, the last five decades, have been based on two discoveries. And my telling you is not enough. You have to discover this for yourself. The first is that we have 66 books, hopefully sitting in your lap, that were written by over 40 guys who didn't even know each other over a period of almost 2,000 years. The discovery is, in two parts, we have in our possession an integrated message system. It's, even though it was written in 66 books by over 40 guys over two, almost 2,000 years, we now discover that every detail, every number, every place name, is there by deliberate design. And that's, you ha that's something you have to discover for yourself. But when you do, it'll change your entire perspective because you'll stumble to a second discovery, deriving from that one, that the origin of that message system had to come from outside our time domain because it writes history before it happens with a precision that's staggering. And those discoveries are something you need to discover for yourself. And I don't mean just thematically. Every number, every letter in both the Old and New Testament is there by, in the original, is there by deliberate design. Now, we uh, made reference here to Psalm 19. C.S. Lewis says the greatest psalm in the Psalms and one of the greatest lyrics in the world. Let's take a close look at the first few verses of Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth, she, excuse me, uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out throughout all the earth and their words to the end of the world. That may be familiar to you, but let's look, exa look examine it. You'll discover every line talks about the information sciences. Declare, showeth, other speech, showeth knowledge. Um, sp speech, language, voice. See, every line speaks of the information sciences. And uh, so... The point of this is, there is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. That's holding us all accountable. And Paul makes that point in Romans chapter 1. The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, but being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without dis uh, excuse. And uh, <clears throat> so that holds us accountable too. The following terms, I want to show you a series of opposites. We have disorder and order, noise and signal. Engineers like to improve the signal to noise ratio. Cacophony music, chaos and cosmos, randomness, randomness or design. Those are opposites. We need to understand that. Those on the left are all expressions of a term that mathematically we call entropy. Think of entropy as randomness, and you'd be shocked at how many brilliant mathematicians, including Stephen Hawking, uh, uh, don't follow this co correctly. Entropy is equivalent to randomness. The opposite of that is information. Each one on the left is the opposite of the ones on the right. And the, you need to understand those are opposites. In fact, as time goes on, things will drift to the left. You clean up your garage or your locker in school, after a few weeks, it's back the way it was. Things tend towards randomness, towards entropy. And I want to develop that a little bit as we go. Randomness and entropy, most of us have been trained in deterministic mathematics. But there's a whole other field of mathematics, stochastic, where there's random variables involved. It's a different process. In fact, random numbers, numbers are almost impossible to find. What you technically find when you need them are what called pseudo-random numbers that are almost random. Getting a true random number is a real challenge. In fact, the granddaddy of think tanks, the Rand Corporation, back in 1955, d 
had a milestone book which they published called One Million Random Digits and 100,000. That book, if I had it sitting here, I don't carry it because it's big and heavy, but the point is that book, if you look at it, you think it's a put on, a joke. You open it up and it's full of random numbers. And to the layman, you sort of laugh. That's pretty silly. No. It was a breakthrough in science because the Rand Corporation had access to the most powerful computers available at that time. And the idea, that's, see that's not as trivial as it sounds, what is the defining characteristic of that book? The total absence of design. They used supercomputers to explore that thoroughly so there was no symmetry, no predictability, no patterns of any kind, no predictability. As best as we could make it at that time, that was the best available is that that was a source of random numbers. That may sound silly if you haven't been in a laboratory where you need random numbers for some purpose. They're hard to find. So with that background, I want to move into the topic that they've asked me to speak on, the Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, if you master and understand and command that, it'll solve all your other problems. That's the granddaddy of them all. In the in the Hebrew, of course, it goes from right to left. All, all languages flow towards Jerusalem. You know that. East of Jerusalem, they go right to left. West of Jerusalem, they go left to right. And they, whether it's Cyrillic or English or Latin on the one hand, or Aramaic, Hebrew, or, or whatever on the Sanskrit on the right. But anyway, Bereshit, bara, the word bara is to create, create out of nothing. There are other words that can be used, ask her, us, if that, that's to make her fashion. When it used bara, that's from out of nothing. And then we encounter Bereshit bara Elohim. Now you probably know enough Hebrew exposure to know that a masculine a word with an I-M ending is a plural. Elohim is a plural noun. But there's something very strange because every time you see that in the Bible, it's misused. You know enough about language to know the, the noun is supposed to be declined with the verb. They're supposed to match. Elohim is a plural noun, but it's always used as a singular with this, as a, by the verb. Elohim, every place you see it, is a technical error in a sense. Elohim is a plural noun. What you also need to know about Hebrew is that a plural is not two, it's three. They have a single, a dual, and a plural. But let's move on and take a look at Genesis 1, because that's really the subject here. God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw the light, and that it was good. God divided the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were day one. And uh, now, the word evening, that's translated evening, comes from the word erev. That came to mean eve, but that wasn't the original concept behind it. And the other word is boker, which is now they use it for morning. Why do they do that? Because ne the, neither of these, by the way, will show up on day seven. Did it not have an evening and morning? Of course it did. But what the words are focusing is on a prior, more per per uh, pervasive meaning. Let's take a look at an energy profile, entropy profile, of the universe. I'm putting entropy at the bottom of the chart and order at the top. In other words, Entropy is the, is the maximum at the bottom, and order is maximum at the top. Are you with me so far? Okay. Day one, we have Erev and Boker, which is a reduction of entropy, or an increase in order, okay? Erev means disorder or obscurity, and at night things are dark and obscure. And that word also gets, becomes meaning for night, but at a prior, it's a pun, but it's the prior meaning is um, Erev. Boker is discernible order. We're going from disorder to order, going from Erev to Boker. And that comes to mean morning and evening, but that is a pun, if you will, of a deeper meaning, if I may. Now, on that first day, God makes his first direct quote in the Bible. Let light be. And let's take a look at, as we study the very nature of light. Boy, we could spend a whole hour talking about that. But most of you realize that every particle has an has a antiparticle, and when an antiparticle hits a positive particle, they annihilate each other and give off a photon, give off light. And uh, Richard Feynman found tech will tell you a reversal of light, uh, that, that, that uh, uh, particle is a, that same particle in a time reversal. But another way of saying that is if I reverse the entropy, that shows how light can create a symmetrical set of particles out of nothing. 
And that's the mechanism we find in day one. But let's move to day two. From Erev to Boker, there's another step of creation, and that's creating the atoms and the molecules. Let's talk about an atom, because this is a, a, a grasp you really need to get. We've all in school made little diagrams, and I'm using a hydrogen one of the simple ones. We have a nucleus and an electron going around it. This is not the scale, but I'm going to try to communicate the scale to you if I can. We know that the atom is about 10 to the minus 8 centimeters in size. The nucleus is about 10 to the minus 13. The numbers aren't important, but the ratio is. What we're saying here is that the it takes, it takes 100,000 that distance to make the, the orbit of the electron. 100,000. The ratio between the two is 10 to the fifth, 100,000. Well, if that's the linear distance, the area would be that squared, right? So that would be 10 to the tenth. The volume would be that number cubed. You with me so far? How many follow that? Okay, good, great. It need talking to men. Women don't, usually aren't with me here. Okay. So the, that's the 10 to the 15th number is a staggering number. And I remember I was with, on a board with Dr. Teller, and uh, they were talking, they were using a 10 to the 15th number, and I said, wow, that's more than there are seconds in 30 million years. They looked at me sh shocked. They use those numbers, but they didn't have a a personal grasp of what they mean. See, 10 to the 15th is the same ratio as one second has to 30 million years. See, when I say it that way, you get a feeling for what 10 to the 15th is. If I say this podium is solid, and you say, no, Chuck, there's nothing here, you're more right than I am by a ratio of one second to 30 million years. This is an electrical simulation. It feels solid because the molecules of my hand are colliding with the molecules of the... So it feels solid. That's an electrical illusion. It's a virtual thing. We're going to get into that, believe it or not. So, so passion see best. We're learning the properties. The property, space is not empty. It has permittivity. It has permeability. As any radio ham will tell you, it has intrinsic impedance. When you tune an antenna for transmission, you're trying to match the impedance to the impedance of space. Velocity of light, of course, has been slowing down. That's a whole other story. But the zero-point energy, most physicists will tell you that's just a mathematical concept. No, there's a surprise coming. They've now discovered that the zero-point energy is measurable, it's staggering, and it's revising our whole perception of subatomic particles. So that it happens as you get into that and really understand the fabric space, the arguments fall into our lap as creationists, by the way, and I won't go into all the details there. I'll just highlight that you be aware of this as you hear, hear talked about. If the temperature of an empty container is lowered to absolute zero, there remains a residual amount of thermal energy that cannot by any means be removed. It's called the zero point energy. A vacuum is now known to have, be a vast reservoir of seething energy of which partic uh, that particles being formed and annihilated constantly. Why does the electron in an atom not radiate itself out and collapse. Why does that happen? Because it's made up by the zero point energy replaces it. And that's why they can do it. That's exactly what Paul tells you in First Colossians, Colossians 1, by the way. But we'll move on here. Let's go to date. We're just getting warmed up. We're going to date three already. And there we have the land and the, uh, the, the oceans and so forth. Just take one thing off the earth, take a leaf off a tree, and you discover it's more complicated than most of us can possibly understand. In fact, not only that leaf itself, but its place in the cycle. The plants give off the, the oxygen and the sugar, and the animals need that, and they give off the CO2, which the plants need. And this whole model is in balance. That not only means it was created, it means it's being maintained. They always say 1% change in the ozone is going to bring cosmic disaster. You've heard that from your greenies, right? Well, if that's true, who, who, who balanced it so delicately in the first place? See, that argument that it's rare is an argument for creation, not, uh, not at the accident of design. But we'll move on. Let's go to day four. Adam and Boker, we come to, the, to what we call our solar system. Bear with me on this model, because I think this is one of the things you'll want to take away in your notes. Um, Robert Burnham publishes a Celestial Almanac, and in that he has a chapter that's too provocative to pass. He takes advantage of a coincidence. The number of inches in a statute mile is 63,360. Okay. 
it turns out that, see, the, the basic unit in astronomy is the distance from the Earth to the Sun. That's called an astronomical unit. It happens, the number of inches in a statute mile is roughly 63,300. The number of astronomical units in a light year is roughly the same number to a tenth of a percent difference. So that's a convenient way to make a model. If we're going to make a model here of the universe, we can use that ratio and, and carry it out. In Burnham's model, one inch represents the distance of the sun to the Earth, one mile represents a light year. Are you with me so far? Okay. Well, the sun is about a th a nine thousandths of an inch, let's call it a hundredth of an inch. Okay. So it's about the size of a period on the sentence on your paper. On your piece of paper, you have a period there, that's about, I'm going to suggest that's probably about a hundredth of an inch. You with me? That's the size of our sun in this model. All planets will turn out to be lying within a one meter circle. The Earth will be one inch away from the sun by definition. Mercury and Venus, four tenths or seven tenths radius. Mars about 1.6 inches. Jupiter about five inches. Saturn about uh, nine and a half. Uranus about 19.2. Neptune 30.0. Pluto 39.5 inches. In other words, if we're building this model, we have a period, the center of the sun, and the entire model would be within a radius of one meter. Are we together so far? So far we're doing what we can sort of visualize that. That's important. Well, the nearest star, the nearest star is Alpha Centauri, four and a half light years away. Okay, so we need a speck. It's about the same size as our sun, so it's a speck about the size of a period that we've got to not only place four and a half miles away in our model, Okay, that's two specks of dust, four and a half miles apart. How much influence would gravity have to two specks of dust, four and a half miles away, when you're supposed to square the distance between them? In other words, it's worse than that. Uh, by the way, the Milky Way would be 100,000 miles in radius. If you look at your equation of, of, uh, of gra gravitation, it has a denominator of the distance squared. In other words, whatever the distance is, you've got to square that in the denominator, which means the further away they are, it disappears into being meaningless. You with me so far? See, the, big, the, the plasma physicists have been trying to sell that, tell that to us for several decades. The astronomers aren't listening. They haven't done the math. If you take a look at your fundamental forces from your textbooks, you'll discover that gravity is 10 to the minus 38, electromagnetic 10 to the minus 2. In other words, electromagnetics are outperform gravity by 10 with 36 zeros after it. Not 36,000 times, 36 umptiums, whatever you're going to call. The and by the way, the electric pushes and pulls. Gravity doesn't. So the real point is, the minute you go beyond our solar system, look at the sky, the, the, the galaxies, gravity is a non-player. And what's astonishing, there are bright mathematicians spending all kinds of theories that make no sense because they haven't done the math. 99.9% .9 of the mass of the universe is not solid. It's not solid, liquid, or gas. It's plasma. It is uh, uh, ionized gas. And, and, the, and uh, the plasma pioneers have been trying to tell us that. They can create the same shapes in the laboratory using Maxwell equations, not gravity. And so that we have all this in our briefing package if you want to chase these things down. But the real point is, let's go one step further. We then have the birds and, the, and we have this whole business of the death of Darwinism. The thing that put the nails in Darwin's coffin was, of course, microbiology. Advances in microbiology, the DNA and so forth, have dealt the death blow to Darwinism. The DNA happens to be, we discover, a three out of four error-correcting code. An alphabet of three to use three out of four, alphabet of 22, three out of four. That is, <clears throat> there's probably not an engineer in the audience that can build and can design an error-correcting code, error-detecting step one. No, the next step is an error-correcting code. It turns out if you use 11 bits rather than eight for a byte, you can make it error-correcting to a certain level. We've now discovered recently, there's articles, they've discovered that the code in the, in the code in the DNA has a code within the code because there's common codes that do the same thing but not quite the same thing. And they take a little longer because it changes the three-dimensional shape and 
There's more coding that they're discovering. There's a whole other level of coding to it. Darwinism cannot explain the origin of life because it cannot explain the origin of information. That's the corker. Irreducible complexity that Michael B. introduces definitely just renders chance or randomness uh, uh, as it, it, it refutes that as a possible designer. And you can get into that on your own. But let's take six. You've all heard the six of the number of man. How many have heard that? Biblically. Well, it's a little more than that. We go on the sixth day, and I'm going to use um, Da Vinci's Vitruvia of Man as a symbol of man and his reach, if you will. Uh, six is the number of man we hear. It turns out, I read this and I didn't believe it, I thought it was some Christian contrivance, and I checked it out, it turns out to be true. A cellular level, an intact human immune system will virtually always recognize and reject a non-human transplant as foreign. How? The underlying characteristic, what's the underlying characteristic of humanity? On virtually every nucleated cell in, in a person are small markers, lipoproteins to be precise, called antigens. Their official designation is the histocompatibility antigen or human leukocyte antigen. HLA is the common thing. And it turns out certain antigens are the same in every human and are only found in humans, although given individuals may have different arrangements and collections of these molecules. That's what makes different, it's important in blood transfusions and other things. The irony is that every person, on virtually every cell in that person, the mar this marker mankind's product, and it's a product of one certain chromosome. It's chromosome, guess which number? Six. I used to think that's a chromosome. No, it turns out that's the, that's the locus of the genes that, are, that encode humans uh, on the surface of the cells and so forth. And uh, so it has many other functions, but it is, resides in, uh, on uh, number six. I thought that was interesting. But let's, the interesting provocative thing, when you get to day seven, we know that the creation stopped, right? How many knew that God rested on the seventh day? Okay, not on Sunday, that's sad, that's Shabbat, by the way, but let's move on here, okay. What's interesting is there's no error of invoker on that day. That's a tip-off that those words had more original, they're used as puns for evening and morning daily, and that's why the Hebrew calendar starts in the evening, starts in the morning, because of that patterning. But that's not what the words originally meant. In fact, when we go through Genesis and our commentary, we, take a, we have a full lecture series on each day. On day one, we get into the paradoxical nature of light itself, the gap between the first two verses, and that sort of thing. On the second day, we get into the fabric of space, hypertension, quantum physics, and so on. On the third day, we get into life agitation, that's the origin of life, thermodynamics and entropy, and molecular chemistry. On the fourth day, we get into the nuclear hypothesis myth. What you taught in college about the story of the origin is provably not true, but it's still taught in college for some weird reason. The anthropic principle and astrobiology is a science without any evidence. The frustration of astrobiology is there is no life anywhere off the earth. So trying to study evidence of that is a waste of time because they can't find any they've been looking for. But anyway, we move on. The, the, we call evolution, you really mean biogenesis, but we get into that on the fifth day, of course, for a lot of reasons. And then we get into the fallacies and frauds of Chick's day and, and, and all that. And then, of course, the seventh day is a provocative thing because that when God enforces a repose on the universe, he sets up, makes the laws uh, firm. So there's another thing I want to highlight, and I'm going to draw this, uh, for this on the Scientific American articles recently. I'm going to use the symbol of man to represent the reach of man. If I'm, I'm going to focus on things larger than man, I'll call that collectively the macrocosm. And the fourth dimension of time, of course, is in that subject. It had a beginning. The big discovery of 20th century science is that the universe is finite, not infinite. It may be expanding, but it's finite, not infinite. That's the problem. That's what Lee, that means it had a beginning, and that's why they have these speculations called the Big Bang models. But the fact that it's finite is a key fact. Let's go the other way. Let's go things that are smaller, man. Let's start with what we call the microcosm. We discover that in subatomic particles, there's a limit to smallness. That's why we're spending tens of billions of dollars on the Hadron Colliders to try to learn more about smallness. It turns out there's a limit to smallness. It's called the Planck wall, if you will. Indivisible units. Planck limits for length, mass, energy, and time. You would think if I take a piece of string and cut it in half, I can throw it half away and do it again. You think, concept, I could do that forever. I might get so small I couldn't handle it, but conceptually I could always figure whatever I got I can cut in half. I discover that's not, that's not true. 
When it gets 10 to the minus 33 centimeter, and I try to cut it in half, it loses a property that the physicists call locality. There's a property called non-locality. That thing is provably everywhere in the universe at one time, and that's been proven in the laboratory, by the way. So that's not just a theory anymore. And we now don't think of three or four dimensions. We know we live in at least 10. That's the current estimate. But the key point that you want to understand the implications of is that both the macrocosm has a finite and so of largeness, and there's a finite limit to smallness. That has staggering implications in our understanding of reality. Because the Scientific American article it deals with, see, we, we live in a finite uh, digital uh, simulated universe. It's a virtual digital environment that we find ourselves in. Now, this is not my conclusion. This is the word of Scientific American, June of 2005, where they conclude that our universe is but a shadow of a larger reality. That's their words, not mine. And I, when I first read it, it blew me away, because that's exactly what the Bible has been saying all along. In, in uh, John 1, Hebrews 1, uh, on and on. That larger reality, we, we, our reality is in a larger context. For lack of another term, I'll call it the metacosm. That's the domain of the angels. That's the domain, apparently, of the UFOs. There's a region that is a, a transfer function for in and out of our finite simulation that we call our physical reality. This is all provable. This isn't theoretical. This is provable stuff. We, we think of, we, of three dimensions. We've been taught Euclidean geometry, three dimensions. But the most important lecture in mathematics ever given was June 10th of 1854 when George Riemann uh, dis disclosed metric tensors. It took 60 years for them to find practical use, and that's what Einstein used for his theory of relativity when he re recognized that we live in not three but four dimensions. And, and so then in Ephesians chapter 3, Paul tells us that, by the way you're watching for it. Ephesians 3, 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, <clears throat> that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is that breadth, length, and depth, and height, uh, to know the love of Christ which passes the knowledge that ye might be filled with the whole, all the fullness of God. The point is breadth, length, depth, and height. We, what we're, anyway, four dimensions. Back in the 12th century, a Hebrew sage by the name of Nachmanides, by studying Genesis, concluded the universe has ten dimensions. We can only know about four of them. His writings in his commentary on Genesis. The, plasma, the particle physics in the 20th century have now concluded that we live in about ten dimensions. That's a current estimate. Four are directly measurable, three in a time. Six of them are curled less than 10 to the minus 30 centimeters, two small, small lights, so we can only infer them indirectly. In other words, we've spent millions of dollars on atomic accelerators to learn what Nachmanides learned from studying the text of Genesis. And you think I'm kidding, I'm not, I'm quite serious. So most of what we know about the creation is post-curse, because we all know about Genesis 3. History as we know it started after that curse. We had the flood of Noah, for, among other things, that have increased the entropy, decreased the order, if you will. Now. Entropy is called the bondage of decay in, Ro in Romans 8.21. There are many of us that believe it was introduced as part of the uh, uh, curse. The universe was fractured, separated from four to six dimensions is one speculation. And uh, so it, at that curse, we have the physical universe, which we can directly access, but the other six dimensions are not accessible to us now. And we, so we give that, we call that the spiritual universe, or I would call it the metacosm, if you will. Genesis 3, the shining one, the forbidden fruit, you all know the story, the doubt and then the denial that, created, that Satan created that resulted in God's declaration of war in which the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent are the two contestants, if you will, in a sense. And uh, the seed of the woman being a title of Christ and the seed of the serpent is one who is yet to make his appearance in our history shortly. You are both the pawns and the prize in that the warfare. And that's why we're here together on this thing. Why right now? I, I'm going to put something on the screen which if you accept, you flunk the course. I want you to challenge. I'm putting it up on sincerely, but I want you to challenge it. I believe that you and I are being plunged into a period of time 
about which the Bible says more than it does about any other period of time in history, including the time that Jesus walked the shores of Galilee. And so, now, the more you know about the classic biblical scenario and the pending turmoil amidst the current geopolitical tensions every day that are increasing, the more you will recognize that we are indeed plunging into what's called in the scripture the end times. You can prove it. And the encroaching darkness is becoming, making all of us increasingly politically incorrect. To be a biblical Christian is going to be increasingly a life-threatening posture you're going to have. And as J. Vernon McGee and others predicted, the attack against the biblical Christian will come from the denominational churches. And that's a shock, but you can find it documented by E.H. Broadbent in his book, The Pilgrim Church. Are you prepared for that? We meet here and enjoy this. This is great. Are you prepared for what's really coming? Are you prepared? Microsoft is not. <laughs> okay, I'll try to get another one. Okay. Even correct science won't help you. Only a personal relationship with the designer himself will help you. Do you know him? That's the question of the day. Search the scriptures you're cha challenged by him, and he takes the commitment that you will know. He will assume the responsibility to reveal himself to you. So... I'll, I'll close with a contemporary example here. Just one, and I'll be off here. In 1980, a man from Rwanda was forced by his tribe to either renounce Christ or face certain death. He refused to renounce Christ, and he was killed on the spot. The night before, he had written the following commitment, which is found in his room. I'm a part of the fellowship of the unashamed. I have Holy Spirit power. The die's been cast. I've stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I'm a disciple of his. I won't look back, let up, slow down, back away, or be still. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense. My future is secure. I'm finished with low living, sight walking, small planning, smooth knees, colorless dreams, tame divisions, mundane talking, cheap living, and dwarf goals. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotions, plaudits, or popularity. You can tell you went to seminary because you make an alliteration that proves it's true, right? Okay. I don't have to be right, first, tops, recognized, praised, regarded, or rewarded. I, know, <clears throat> I now live by faith. I lean on his presence. I walk by patience. I lift by prayer and labor by power. My face is set. My gate is fast. My goal is heaven. My road is narrow. My way rough. My companions few. My guide reliable, but my mission is clear. I cannot be bought, compromised, detoured, lured away, turned back, deluded, or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of the adversary. I will not negotiate at the table of the enemy. I will not ponder at the pool of popularity or meander at the, in the maze of mediocrity. I won't give up, shut up, let up until I have stayed up, stored up, prayed up, paid up, and preached up for the cause of Christ. Amen. Praise God. I'm a disciple of Jesus. I must go till he comes, give till I drop, preach till all know, work till he stops me, and when he comes for his own, he'll have no problems recognizing me. My banner will be clear. Praise God. A little more, but I think I'm over my time. God bless you. Thank you.